The Mental Health Series is brought to you by Microgains and Dominion Strength. You know, both are longtime friends and sponsors of the Barbell Logic podcast, and neither hesitated for a second in wanting to sponsor a series that they know is incredibly important to so many people. Both companies are true small businesses, American-owned, and 100% of all their products are made here in the United States. You'll hear more about that later in the show. For the finest quality fractional plates, visit microgains.com. That's with a Z, microgains with a Z.com. And for the highest quality leather belts, go to dominionstrengthtraining.com. Both use discount code LOGIC for a significant discount off their products exclusively for Barbell Logic listeners. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is Coach Brooke. I'm joined today by Dr. David Pewter, psychiatrist, psychotherapist, and host of the Psychiatry and Psychotherapy Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about training with depression. So we recently did an episode on coaching lifters with depression. This episode is going to be for the lifter, how they can continue to train through their depression episode. So it's going to be a lot of similar material, but also some new material. So if you listen to that one, you'll still glean some new information from this one. Yeah, it's good to be on. Can I start by telling this like kind of common story that I hear from people? Sure. Okay. So a common story that I hear is that people got depressed sometime in their life, you know, time course wise. And like often it's like college, first year of college, I got depressed. And when I get their sort of athletic history from them, they played three sports in high school, but when they went to college, guess what they did? Nothing, <laughs> you know, or maybe just like, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a, one workout a week or something like a pickup game or something like that, but basically nothing. And it's like, what other variables changed? Well, of course they went to a new school, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I think what has occurred to me over and over is that people do worse mental health wise when they stop working out. And so one of the questions I have over and over again is how do I get my depressed patients working out? Like, how do I actually mm -hmm. get them exercising? And if they are very low motivation to start with, low energy, low motivation, low pleasure in doing things, they may not enjoy exercise like they used to at first, right? So when they mm -hmm. start up, they're not enjoying it. So they have to get through that sort of place of apathy into a place where they're actually enjoying it again, which may take time. So I think that's kind of, in my mind, where I would start this episode. So the why training? How, well, how do we get them activated and training if they're depressed? Like, let's say I refer a depressed patient to you as a trainer right? As I've done before. Not naming any names. Yeah. <laughs> not naming any names, not naming the situation, but like, mm -hmm. what would you do to start out? So ideally, if possible, if they have the equipment and if they have just enough knowledge and motivation, you'd want to get them started on regular LP strength training program because it's been shown in studies that anaerobic training is a little bit more effective than aerobic training in lessening depressive symptoms. But yeah, there can be situations where somebody is just so depressed that that alone can be a huge hurdle to have to overcome. So in those kind of situations, you have to meet a lifter where they're at. So if you're lifting, if you're training and you're in that kind of a situation where it's just getting started is such a huge barrier, you have to figure out what you can do. And it might be something small. It might be, I'm going to go on a 10 minute walk a few times a week and that's it. But you know, over time, those little walks add up. They can be a little bit longer. Maybe at one point you might feel like you have the motivation to do jogs, do push-ups, but it's important to understand that doing something is better than doing nothing. So there's one thing you said there, LP, so linear progression, what we're talking about is squatting, deadlifting, pressing, benching, like the basic compound, large muscle movements that we talk about in like barbell lifting. And there, you know, there's a lot of episodes in this podcast on that, so we don't need to go into it in exquisite detail. But I think it's worth 
sort of underline that a lot of these patients that I would refer probably have never lifted before. Or if they did, most people, even if they like played football and they lifted or they you know did some sort of sport where they lifted, they don't really understand a lot of the nuance of lifting, of training. You know, most people, they go into the gym, they bench 135 because they've always benched 135. They're going to do mm-hmm. it 10 times because they've always done it 10 times. And when they do squats, you know, they're number one, they're usually going to skip leg days because that's painful. But when they do mm-hmm. squats, they're going to do the same weight that they've always done, maybe 95 pounds, you know, sets of seven or sets of 10, and they're doing, you know, three or four sets. So I think what we're talking about is a little bit more specific because it's really helping them gain strength. And there is a correlation between the reduction of depression and the gain of strength. So the people who are able to gain the most strength are going to have the most reduction in their depressive scores. So as a psychiatrist, I want something very specific. I want the person to get stronger. And so if we're talking about a cachectic person who's not leaving their bed for weeks and weeks, yeah, walking would be a linear progression of sorts, right? Mm -hmm. Just getting them to do five minutes of walking on day one, and then on day three, they're going to go out, maybe add one minute to it. And every other day, they're going to add one minute until they're up to like half an hour, right? So now they're doing Mm -hmm. something physical. But then moving them from there to a point of doing barbell training is something I've had a lot of difficulty doing with my clients. I'm Mm -hmm. just going to be honest. Like I tell them to go out, here's the videos I have on my website. Like here's the videos to learn how to do the movements. Here's the books to buy. Here's the podcast you could listen to. And I would have to say just that has led to almost zero success. Well, it can be overwhelming if you're not used to this kind of exercising all of that material. Cause you know, we are very particular about technique and progressing a certain way and things like that. And for somebody who's depressed and apathetic that can seem like, okay, now I have to read all of this material on strength training. Maybe I don't fully understand it. It's a lot of technical jargon in here. So that's where it can be really helpful to just hire a coach, you know, work with somebody, have them figure out all of that stuff. And then all you need to do is focus on getting to the gym and doing your workout and doing something. You don't have to think through every little detail. Yeah. And then you have a coach there who's really in tune with you and able to make adjustments as needed. Yeah, so that's what I was leading into. The success that I've had is getting people connected to a coach, whether it's an online coach or an in-person coach. And some people, the online coach needs to be one that's gonna engage them probably more early on Mm -hmm. to get them sort of up and going, you know, here's the equipment, here's the stuff. And then once they're up and going, maybe it, you know, there's a little bit less involvement that's necessary, but it seems that just kind of the inertia to get someone off and started, there's this inertia. And so the coach is so necessary for that. Mm -hmm. It's so necessary. Yeah. The coach is going to do a number of different things. So obviously they're going to help with technical feedback, making sure that you're doing things correctly. You're not going to hurt yourself. They're going to provide that customized programming because again, it can be really stressful to try to figure all that out on your own. They're going to be a big help with accountability. Just having somebody there who's expecting your workout can sometimes be enough of a motivator. You know, you don't want to let them down. You don't want to disappoint them. And then they also provide support. So just having somebody there caring for you, really trying to what they want, what's best for you can help as well. Yeah. Yeah. Having someone in your corner, right? Having Mm -hmm. someone it's like, who's giving energy into this area of your life, who's breathing knowledge, hope. And really, you know, like I've coached what, maybe like 10 people, maybe 20 people out of my garage, but to put someone in the hands of someone who's coached like a couple hundred, it's just a different world. And I'm not, you know, getting anything from you guys, Barbell Logic financially. So I'm not saying this because i necessarily financially benefit, but I do personally benefit from having a coach. And I think that without a coach, it's just really hard to move forward. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, how do you even start without some sort of guidance? Like sometimes when when it's so difficult for you to even try to figure out, you know, how am I going to eat enough food during the day? How am I going to get out of bed today? You know, how are you going to add on top of that, all of this training stuff? So having a coach can be incredibly helpful. 
if you have a lot of issues with depression, you know, your depression's really intense or really frequent, I would even recommend trying to search out a coach who has a special interest in mental health, just because that's going to play a really big role in kind of your communication and how your programming needs to be altered and things like that. Yep. I have had some patients who have even needed in-person coaches. And I've had a couple in this COVID season where I like know people in their town and I have them literally drive to their house and give them in-person training. And honestly, I feel like if they didn't have that, well, they wouldn't have a gym to go to and they probably wouldn't do very much, you know? Mm -hmm. And with a couple of these clients, like initially they need that coach there whenever they work out, but eventually they can start to have a coach that comes one day a week, you know, and maybe they do two workouts on their own. But it seems like it's always easier to go hard if there's someone there with you mm -hmm. or someone in your sort of corner who's like monitoring what you're doing at least. Yeah. So that's a big benefit of in-person coaching. You get that instant feedback. You have somebody right there with you. So you can't, you know, slack off or skip your workouts. With online coaching, I think it would be really important to make sure that you are working with the coach who's reviewing your workouts regularly and ideally in a short time frame, because that's going to mimic that as closely as possible as opposed to kind of a hands-off coaching approach where maybe you just get programming. And other than that, you don't have like a lot of feedback. Yeah. Have you ever had like a client who got so depressed that they just stopped working out and there was nothing you could do for them? Yes. Yeah. That does happen sometimes. Of those patients that struggle with mental health issues, like what percentage do you have that just stop working out and there's nothing you can do to help them? Um, I think it's, it's hard for me to think of a percent. Um, I would say that it's more frequent in lifters who are moderately to severely depressed, that when their depression just gets to a certain point, they just completely stop and it's very difficult to get them back into the gym. What's really important is if you're going through an episode like that, it's really important that you continue to have conversations with your coach. It's really tempting when you're that depressed to kind of go off into your own bubble and not communicate with anybody else. But a coach needs to know that, you know, you're still alive, you're still okay, they care about you, that you're doing your best to get through this episode, to get the motivation to go back to the gym, to continue to push through. And that lets them know too, when you have better communication, it's also easier to tell your coach when things are going wrong, what exactly is going wrong. So yeah, the communication aspect when you're not able to complete your workouts is incredibly important. Yeah. Let me just mention what severe depression looks like. Like, so when we talk about severe depression, when you think about your interest or pleasure in doing things, you'd probably say nearly every day you wouldn't have this pleasure or interest in doing things. You know, nearly every day you would feel down, depressed, hopeless. Nearly every day you would have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep too much. Nearly every day you would feel tired or have little energy. Nearly every day you would have poor eating or overeating. Nearly every day you'd feel bad about yourself or that you're a failure or have let yourself or your family down. You know, nearly every day you may have issues with focus and concentration, such as reading a newspaper, watching television even. And, you know, nearly every day you're having issues feeling so fidgety and restless that you're moving more than usual or the opposite, sort of you can't move very much. And then I would say anytime you have any thoughts of suicide, any thoughts of wanting to be dead, not alive, wishing you were dead, that would be also more of the severe depression. And you may answer those things like more than half the days and that you could still be in a more severe depression even if those were more than half the days. But if that's the case, you know, you really need like a comprehensive approach to your depression if you're severely depressed. Like exercise is one of those things that you can do. You can actually physically do this and it will make your depression better than it was before. I, I was talking to a patient today and I was telling him, if you get a good workout regimen and you continue it, you know, these spikes of depression may be lessened, meaning you may have less spikes of depression and you may have, when they happen, they may not rev up as severely. Okay. So it's like the full burden of suffering will decrease you know, mm -hmm. compared to like what it would be. Like if you consider like all of the burden of suffering that goes on with depression, like having a good regimen will keep you from having those peaks as wide and as tall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so sometimes it's when my patients are out of the depression, like they've been treated on antidepressants, they've been treated with therapy, and now their depression's like a smoldering two out of 10 to three out of 10. That's when I'm like, 
really on them to like, hey, let's get you completely out of depression. And to get completely out of depression, we need to insert some exercise here. And we need to focus on your diet a little bit because you're eating a bunch of processed garbage mm-hmm. that like you wouldn't give to it an animal that you loved. Mm-hmm. You know, you would give, yeah. you would give, you would, <laughs> you wouldn't feed your cat that food that you're eating, right? Mm-hmm. That should be a barometer that something's wrong here. That's a really good point on the treatment, though, is that as helpful as training is, it shouldn't be seen as this is going to cure your depression. This is all you need. You know, there are a lot of situations where this is works really, really well with other forms of treatment. So if you are on medication, if you're seeing a therapist, we're not saying that you should stop all of that and just do strength training. If you add this in on top of that, that'll be just something else that kind of pushes you more toward, you know, better mental health. Yep. One of the first things we tell our clients they need when they start strength training is a great weightlifting belt. And Blake and Katie from Dominion Strength Training make the highest quality belts on the planet. Dominion is a wonderful small business, literally two people who have spent years refining their craft to personally hand make every single belt on their site as the orders come in. They aren't shipping something that they pull off a shelf, but are actually building your personal order from the raw materials, sewing the belts on these wonderful 100 year old leather sewing machines that produce a much better stitch in the heavy leather than any of the more modern lightweight machines. And much of the finish work, especially in finishing the edges is done by hand. So this just gives your belt a much more aesthetic finish than feeding the belts through a machine. So for the finest quality, artisanal, handcrafted, but heavy duty belts, all with a lifetime warranty, go to dominionstrengthtraining.com where you can choose the Barbell Logic 4-inch lever belt or any other high quality belt there and receive $10 off your belt order with discount code LOGIC. That's dominionstrengthtraining.com, discount code LOGIC for $10 off your belt order. Yeah. And consider a good training regimen. Like it's more than just, you know, the good hormones that it produces. And it's more than just the increase in the brain drive neurotrophic factor that it produces, like the miracle growth for the brain. I think it also is something that you can change. Okay. So when I think about people in the midst of suffering, one of the things is that they feel is that I can't do anything about this. There's nothing I can do to help myself move forward. There's nothing I could do. I'm stuck, right? And so that's a faulty narrative. There are things that you can identify that you can control and exercising is one of them. And, you know, it reminds me of the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change and the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. It's like, can you know the things that you can't change, right? You can't change how your spouse feels about you, her emotions. You know, you can't change her emotions. You can change your own emotions and your response to her emotions. You may have your own emotions. You can't change them when they happen, maybe, but you can change what happens afterwards, right? You can change how you approach your emotions with your thoughts, right? And your purpose and your intention. You can't change other people. So it's like, you don't wanna invest a lot of energy into thinking about how to change other people. You can change yourself. So it's like in the midst of your depression, you can have the courage to change yourself for the better, right? So you take one step forward. Sometimes it's just taking a pill. Sometimes it's overcoming the shame of going to see a therapist. And in this sense, it's, it's doing the physical exercise and the progressively more difficult exercise that will get scheduled for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least in my experience, I've had a history of depression as well. And it can very much feel like everything's kind of out of your control and you can't do very much. But being able to take little steps and focus in on the things that you can change as opposed to everything else that's going on with your emotions. And also just knowing that that's going to make your future better. I think that's really important. And that's kind of that little bit of shining light, that bit of hope that you might need in those dark times. Yeah. This reminds me of a quote also by this Stoic philosopher, Epictetus. And he said, the chief task in life is simply this, to identify and separate matters so that I can say clearly to myself, which are externals, not under my control, and which have to do with the choices I actually control. So, It's like, how do I start to differentiate what I can control 
and what I can't control. Put those into categories and then think about making some steps towards the things I can control, you know? And one of those things, if you are burdened with depression, one of the things you can control are doing things that give you a sense of meaning and purpose and doing things that are good for your body and doing things that you used to enjoy doing. So one of the very basic psychotherapy techniques is to help someone create a schedule Monday through Friday or Monday through Sunday. And we're going to write into our schedule every day doing those things. We're going to schedule it in for the week. And then we're going to, you know, if you're not able to do it, we're going to, with empathy, look at maybe the difficulties of following through and doing it, but then try to keep going, keep moving forward, doing the things that you used to enjoy that gave you a sense of meaning and purpose, doing exercise, physical things. On that list specifically, we ask people not to include Netflix, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. It's very passive. It's the things like going out to coffee with a friend, things like that, which even if you're depressed and you don't feel like doing it, actually doing it can help you pull out of the depression a little bit. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about the person who's probably listening to this, who's thinking like, I am struggling with depression mm-hmm. and maybe they can't afford, you know, a coach. Well, the first thing I would say to them is like, well, do you have any family that's supporting you that, that values you getting out of depression? Right. Mm-hmm. Cause often it's the family that pays for the therapist. And I think just as much, it's probably important for the family to pay for things like a coach. Like, cause I see it as like one of the things that can really change the outcome. Mm -hmm. So even if you're unable to get a coach, you can maybe see if there's anybody who you could go to the gym with, find a training partner. Maybe this could be a relative, a friend, coworker, somebody else in your household. Just having somebody there with you is sometimes all you need to really get going with your strength training. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's like doing something is better than doing nothing. So you don't have to have it perfect. You know, you don't have to have the perfect regimen of strength training, just getting there, doing something, trying to involve, you know, lower body and upper body throughout the week. That can be really helpful. Yeah. Focus on intensity. The intensity is an important part of strength training. So not just doing really easy light reps over and over, but try to push yourself a little bit, build up some mental fortitude as well. So that's another benefit of strength training is that there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from it that you wouldn't get from other forms of exercising necessarily. So things like you can do more than you think you can. So strength training, there are times when the weight on the bar is so heavy, you think I can't do this, I can't do this. And then you really apply yourself and then you actually are able to overcome it. So I think that's a very important lesson. Another one is you don't need to be perfect to be successful. It's okay to mess up. So you will have misreps here and there, things that don't go quite right with your strength training, but that's okay. You know, you learn from it, you grow, and it doesn't impede the bigger picture. Another important one is your body is more than what it looks like. So this is a really important one for me because I had a lot of issues with, you know, my body and what I looked like and stuff like that. But through strength training, I was able to appreciate my body more and more, not just for what it looked like, but for its performance and what it could do and its function. Those are some really important points. I was actually trying okay. to, I was trying to lean into that a little bit okay. when I said like, it's not just a about the the BDNF. It's not just about the hormones that you produce when you do Mm it. I think a large part of the importance of it comes from doing something hard and learning that you have the capacity to do things beyond what you thought you were able to. And you're allowed to have some self-efficacy. There's You move from an external locus of control, meaning the world is happening to me, to more of an internal locus of control. Like I can do things that change my world for the better. Having that mindset shift is huge. It's absolutely huge. And then enthusiastically like affirm how amazing it is to change from this mindset of like aesthetics, what I look like, like, which by the way, a lot of it's like, we cannot change like the shape of our face, the shape of our, you know, general body to some degree we can. Bone structure. Bone structure, right. So like the world's focus on aesthetics is an empty pursuit as well, because who do we compare ourselves to? Models, where do we see them? Magazines, heavily Photoshopped, right? Mm -hmm. Instagram, heavily Photoshopped pictures. Filters put on pictures. We put filters on ourselves. On videos now. Filters on video, right? And so there's a deep 
unhappiness that comes from this constant comparison, not with the 1% of beauty, but it's like the 0.0001% of beauty. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about like the people, you know, who are Hollywood actors, it's like, they're not like usually in the 1% of attractiveness. They're in like sort of this mythological place of like, (laughs) you know, they have a team of people that work with them to make them look that way. Right. Everything from dietitians to personal trainers, to their own makeup artists and hairstylists. Oh, not only that, but it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars of surgery surgery mm-hmm. often and world-class personal trainers who come every day and help them very sort of regimented diets, human growth hormone, testosterone, like, so supplements, like things that are like illegal for the average person to get, they're often on. So yeah, it's just like, you're comparing yourself to this, this thing that is unobtainable. Right. Mm-hmm. And so to move from that mindset of I want to be like this person. It's almost like a hunger's game level of sort of the most wealthy country in the hunger games. It's like those people who augment their reality not to look mm-hmm. so different than they started from. You know, they even like are looking like animals, right? It's like that level of change. Comparing that to this mindset of like, let's just focus on strength and see strength as something we can control. And then like our value of ourself, how we like look at ourself and sort of like the culture as well that you put yourself into, sort of aspiring not to like be stronger than the next person, but just to see some sort of growth in yourself. You move from Mm -hmm. an external locus of control to an internal locus of control in that sort of shift. I don't know. Does that describe kind of your journey a little bit there or is that different, or maybe you could tell me exactly what that was like for you to make that shift is an ongoing shift. Yeah. I think that kind of describes the journey that I was on. I just spent so many years really fixated on how I look like and things that I wasn't able to change, you know, like body structure, like we talked about before. So being able to, I went to an actual gym, an in-person gym and was coached there, but being surrounded by a bunch of people of all different shapes and sizes, all kind of with this common goal of self-improvement ended up being a really healthy environment. And it helped me move past what I look like and focus more on, you know, what was in my control. I also see like the people who go to the gym just purely for aesthetics. It's like, do you really want to spend like how many hours of your life do you want to spend thinking about what you look like? Mm -hmm. It's like obsessive. It seems like to me that it's like a meditation of sorts, right? The definition of meditation, like mindfulness is to focus on something and what you give attention to you grow, you know? So if your role models that you look up to are obsessive about their, what they look like, or they're obsessive about their body, you know, and that's kind of like where they're putting all their attention, then that becomes like a little bit of what you might be pulled into this mindset of obsessing about aesthetics. It's like a mindfulness activity. You are mindfully focused on this for hours a day, potentially. (laughs) <laughs> Which like, like, what is the result of that? Where does that road go down? Like body dysmorphia, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Deep unhappiness. And sometimes people are successful at attractiveness for decades, right? They get a lot of good things for being super attractive until they're not attractive. And I see those clients as well. They're in their 60s or 70s. I mean, those are the people who successfully navigated it for decades, right? Like even in their fifties, they were very, very attractive people. There's something that happens when they're no longer getting that feedback from people, which is devastating to them. Yeah. And you can hear about that sometimes in people who like get into really bad accidents abruptly when they're younger, you know, their whole life was going to the gym and doing this stuff. And maybe it kind of derails them and it completely changes their body. And that can be difficult to cope with because that was their everything. What they look like was such a huge part of their identity. Yep. I see that. I also see that in people who get like schizophrenia and then they need to be on meds and meds make them gain weight. That Mm. can be really, really difficult. Yep. And you know, there are options that are less weight gainy, but sometimes they're not the best options or the options that they need in the moment. So it can be hard to get them into a healthy place or they, Mm -hmm. it's like they have a new, you know, they have new difficulties 
as their metabolism changes on meds. Mm -hmm. So maybe they can't eat 3,000 calories anymore like they used to. Yeah, so strength training is interesting because you're really focusing on your physical self, but at the same time, you're very much affecting your mental self, your mental health. Right, so I think it's good to think about like when you're doing it, strength being the goal compared to aesthetics or compared to this is what I want to look like. You know, because I think that the mindset of aesthetics, I would argue, although it's very culturally sort of normal to spend time thinking about that, I would say it's like a dead end Mm -hmm. that doesn't, it's not life-giving in the same way as like, okay, I can make small improvements and challenge myself and push through hardship. It's like, for me, it's not about gaining strength necessarily. It's about, it's a little bit beyond that. It's about being the sharpest cognitively Mm -hmm. that I possibly can. You know, like as I get older, I want to age in such a way where I can be the sharpest for my clients, for my grandkids, you know, like, I think that's kind of like underneath some of my drive as well. Yeah. Or just experiencing, um, at this point I experience pleasure when I do it as well. So it's not all suffering for me. It's not all, it's like enjoyable. Like when I go rowing every morning, I've been rowing every morning now. Mm -hmm. It's like very pleasurable to do it. It's like, I'm not like suffering out there. I'm not doing it because I'm suffering or masochistic. Maybe to the, I used to probably be a little bit masochistic in college with it, but now it's like I have pleasure doing it and I have pleasure feeling in shape and, and feeling strong. So it's like, mm-hmm. there's a beauty as well, I think for me, like a beauty in doing it and doing it well, which is, it's not just the acquisition of strength or getting in shape. It's like, there's this sort of beauty from nature, but also from like the the movement, mm-hmm. you know, doing something difficult. I think there's one other aspect I think that's worthy to point out. It's kind of like when you're in the hero's journey, you have trials and the trials get you ready for something. And maybe that, you know, that thing that you're getting ready for is 10 years out. But I think to some degree, practical training to deal with trials, like one of the things you can do is physical strength training. You know, it's like, it's training your mind how to handle stress differently. It's training your body how to handle stress differently. Stress is all handled in our body in one way. It's like when our body is stressed, when our mind is stressed, it's all the same hormones, cortisol, you know, all of this. So doing progressive, thoughtful, incremental strength training can prepare your body to handle stress that is not just purely physical stress. Your body can catabolize emotional stress differently. Mm. Just like... Yeah, you're on a roll. (laughs) I'm just associating all these things, yeah. So... Okay, imagine that you're doing a mindful activity every day. It's kind of like you're choosing your attitude and you're choosing your trajectory, okay? It kind of takes me back to um, what Viktor Frankl said. We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men walking through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man. But one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. What this means to me is that like, you may be choosing your training regimen, you may be choosing to do physical activity or something like that that strengthens your mind, and you may be put in a challenge years later. And that challenge may be something like what Viktor Frankl went through. You know, these men in the concentration camps had a choice. How are they going to interact with other people in the midst of stress, in the midst of hardship? Are they going to give up their last piece of bread at times for someone else? Are they going to ease someone else's suffering? To some degree, I think that's the goal of what it means to be human, right? To be able to help someone else in a time of need. I think as a coach, that's kind of like, what you are doing, right? When you're coaching someone who has depression, it's like, you're not just helping the person get strong. You're helping the person overcome this dark abyss of suffering, internal suffering. And that's beautiful. 
you know, and they then are going to be able to do something similar potentially to other people. They're going to be able to help other people in the midst of their suffering. So it's kind of like, um, you know, passing on the baton of kindness Mm -hmm. to other people and like having something to offer that can help. Yeah, I think that's a really good point to make, you know, as most of us coaches got into strength training to help other people. So being able to do that in different contexts, you know, not just physically, but mentally is really important, you know, especially when you're depressed. That's such a huge part of your health during an episode is just your mental health. And then in turn, as you strength train more and it improves your physical and mental health, you get a better understanding of, you know, how it's shaping you, how you're changing you can use that information and those experiences to help other people in your life. Maybe you have relatives who are depressed or, you know, you meet somebody who kind of needs this and you might be able to help them like your coach helped you or how your training partner helped you. Right. Right. Having gone through it yourself, having gone into the abyss of depression, suffering, of experiencing that, you will be a more useful human being because you're able to then give that gift to other people. And the gift is not just, you know, take this pill, you know, that could be a a small part of it. It could be going to a therapist, that could be a part of it. But it could also be like, do this thing that will help you overcome it from multiple angles, you know? Mm -hmm. Therapy, I think, is really important. I think if you're listening to this and you're depressed and you're not doing therapy, I would also give a big plug for doing weekly therapy. And, you know, like, oh, but it's expensive. Well, you buy a car that's like $20,000 or maybe you don't, but let's say you do. It's like, how much more valuable is your own personal development and growth? I sometimes see people like balk at the price of like a really good therapist. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded that not all therapists are created equal. Yep. There's one study that showed, did I share this one for you? Like, no, super shrink. Mm Mm-mm. There's some therapists that are literally 10 times better than the average therapist. Wow. So if you're listening to this and you have the financial means of seeing a truly excellent therapist, you know, seek out that person. It's like all about finding the best coaches, finding the best resources that you possibly can Mm -hmm. and utilizing your, you know, resources, what they may be to accomplish that. Yeah. And something that you can do in the meantime, which I think would be very helpful, you know, just for people who are depressed in general, but also in a training context is spending a lot of time doing self-reflection. So I've worked with a number of people who have suffered from depression who actually haven't spent very much time trying to get to know themselves. And it makes a really big difference when it comes to, you know, bettering yourself and working with other people to make that happen. So whenever you get the opportunity, what can be you really impactful is just asking yourself a bunch of questions, trying to understand yourself, how you think, how you behave, how does all of that change when you're depressed? So for an example, how would your thinking change when you're depressed? Are you more critical of yourself? Are you obsessed with your perceived failures? Do you have, you know, potentially delusional thoughts about close friends or relatives not liking you? Body dysmorphia, as we talked about before. How does your behavior change? Any changes to eating, sleeping, things like that. Any information you're able to gleam about yourself, your depressive episodes, you can always use that to help guide your training. Yeah, I would say with the caveat that try to not be critical of yourself as you do that. It's Mm -hmm. in the midst of depression, it's easy to be critical of yourself. Like I can even imagine that listening to this, you're like, well, I don't really do anything or I don't you know, really feel like I can do this or I don't, you know, you could start to sort of, even listening to this, you could start to be critical of yourself, which it's really hard to be critical of yourself. And when you're depressed, it's really hard to sort of look down on every aspect of your life and have it all under the microscope in a way that's very critical. And this is where I think if you are very critical of yourself, a good therapist can be helpful. And hopefully I would say one of the criteria, if you're looking for a therapist, is to find someone who you don't feel more critical about yourself around. You know, if they're shaming you, if they're pointing out your faults all the time, if they're making you feel bad about yourself, it's probably not a good fit. It's probably not the person who's going to help you the most. So as you do some of this self-reflection, have some kindness towards yourself. You know, can you see yourself in process? Like, okay, this is where I am now and this is where some of my goals are. 
And, you know, it makes sense why I am where I am now. And I can have some kindness towards myself in that, but I still want to accomplish some goals nonetheless. And here's what my goals might be. Here's how I can take some very, very small steps moving forward. Yeah, sometimes it's easier to do this kind of self-reflection with the help of a professional, or sometimes maybe you don't go too deep into it until after you're out of your depressive episode. I know for myself, I used to do a lot of this self-reflection when I was more like mildly depressed or just not that depressed, kind of looking back on how my behavior changed and taking note of it and how I could use that in the future to be more aware of, hey, you know, I, I have a tendency to get really irritated. So maybe when I notice that happening, I should, you know, not be around other people. Or I would say if you get really irritated, it's like, what is my goal that's being thwarted, you know? Mm. And like, sometimes our frustration comes up when we feel like there's an obstacle in the way of our goal. And so can you see the goal clearly and then see the obstacle and see why you were frustrated? Now the question that comes next is like, okay, how can I best accomplish my goal? Or is this goal even a good goal? And, you know, often what happens when people get irritated or irritable, it's like they forget what their goal is. They get irritated, which sometimes is even counterproductive towards their goal, right? So they're lashing out at their like partner or something like that. And really having a healthy relationship is the goal. Well, lashing out at their partner might not be what moves them towards that healthy goal. So it's like, okay, what other resources can I stick in here to help me process this in a new way that's helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of obstacles, we can also experience obstacles in strength training. So we have this goal to better ourselves physically and mentally, go to the gym, complete our workouts on time, but sometimes things can get in the way of completing those goals. So doing some self-reflection specifically related to training can be very, very helpful. So I kind of call these obstacles to training and they can be both direct or indirect obstacles. So for example, direct obstacles to your training might be specific exercises. Like you really don't like the deadlift. So you're just going to skip your entire workout because you don't want to do the deadlift at all. It might be an exercise intensity. You know, the weight on the bar is really intimidating. Failing reps or using bad technique can be discouraging. Maybe your workouts are just so long that you just don't want to deal with being in the gym for that amount of time or training induced fatigue. You know, you don't want to be super fatigued. That was one for me is I would just get super fatigued from my workouts and I was already really tired from being depressed. So that was an obstacle I sometimes had to try to overcome. And then you can have training obstacles that are indirect. So they're not directly related to your programming. So these are the things like trying to get out of bed, getting ready to go to the gym, I've had a number of clients who had a hard time motivating themselves to go to the gym if they didn't eat enough food beforehand. They felt like it wasn't worthwhile unless they had eaten. Feeling mentally and emotionally drained, constantly tired, apathetic, even driving to the gym or getting out of the car can be a big obstacle. Not wanting to be around other people or displaying standoffish behavior at the gym. Another big one is actually not wanting to read workout feedback later if you have an online coach. So I've had clients purposefully skip workouts because I just couldn't deal with any sort of criticism, even if it was very small, even if it was constructive, it just kind of blew up and became this big thing in their mind. So taking the time to really think about what kind of things might be getting in your way when it comes to completing your workouts, especially when you're working with a coach, that's a very important step to take in order to figure out what's standing in your way and how you can overcome those kinds of obstacles and keep you going to the gym and doing the things that, you know, accomplishing what you want to accomplish. Yeah. So what, what would be some of the concluding thoughts that you would have, Brooke, as you like sort of think about clients who might be depressed who are listening to this? So one of the biggest takeaways is when you're trying to strength train while you're depressed, remember why you started training in the first place. You know, you started training because you wanted to be stronger. You wanted to hit certain PRs or you did it because you wanted to improve your mental health. Feeling apathetic now doesn't mean that you'll always feel that way. Your motivation will come back later and you'll be in a much better place to meet your goals after your episode if you keep pushing forward. Even if it's suboptimal training, it doesn't matter. Continuing to do something is what's important. Yeah, with that, I would say it may take three to four weeks for it to kick in or even six weeks for the benefits to kick in. So when we think about like taking a medication, it takes you know, three to six weeks for the medication to really work for anxiety and depression. And so, you know, think about that with strength training as well. You may feel immediately slightly better, but some of the benefits may take weeks to kick in. 
And just a final word, remember that you are cut out for strength training. So needing to make adjustments so it fits you better or maybe going off the road just a little bit during your episode, it's not a disqualifier. It doesn't mean that you're not cut out for this type of training. You're focusing on your mental and physical health. You're crafting a personalized, sustainable training program and you're improving your quality of life. So don't stop strength training. Excellent. Well, this has been fun. I really hope it's been encouraging to you if you're listening to this, if you're depressed, or if you're thinking about strength training, highly, highly recommend it. It's one of the things that you can do to improve your outcomes. Both, you know, if you've had multiple episodes of depression, it can like decrease future episodes. It can decrease the intensity of future episodes. It can pull you out further from the depression. And, you know, I was just talking to someone the other day, they had been depressed, they said for 11 years. And one thing I said to them was like, you know, I would advise you to keep seeking treatment until you're no longer depressed. And it was like, kind of like a light bulb went off in this person's head of like, oh, you mean I don't need to always be depressed? And it was like, yeah, you don't always need to be depressed. Like you can continue therapy, strength training, diet, you know, treat your obstructive sleep apnea. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, please, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, that's like a total necessity. And um, there may be medication options. So I think there's like, a lot of options for treatment at this point. It's like, are you utilizing your resources that you can to get the best treatment possible? Yep. And if you have any questions about strength training at all, you can reach out to Barbell Logic. There are a whole bunch of coaches here as well if you're looking for coaches who are interested in helping lifters with mental health issues. And there should be more resources coming out on Barbell Logic as well. So keep your eyes out for those. Yeah. And if you want to reach out to me, you can do that on Instagram. I'm just at dr dot david pewter p-u-d-e-r or you could check out my website psychiatrypodcast.com you could send me a message through my contact form there i am more than happy to receive your message and you know if i am in a state where i can treat you california and florida you could consider having me be your doctor if i'm not in your state i do some coaching for select clients or just you know a good referral So let me know how I can help you from the non-barbell side and Brooke will help you from the barbell side. So send her a message. She's on Instagram as well. What's your Instagram? Brooke Haub, H-A-U-B. There you go. It was great having you on. All right. Hey, great to see you again. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye.